Hi, Bill. Thank you again for talking with us today. It's an absolute privilege to have uh, someone like yourself involved in the day. So uh, I'll try and talk as loud as I can to get through these questions, uh, and we can hear you loud and clear. So we have probably about 19 people here today. Uh, some of them are Smart Recovery employees, and 13 of them are peers who are... Um, are uh, people who have come through uh, the Smart Recovery Programme and are now, are now facilitating their own groups. So uh, the first question was just uh, briefly, what initially motivated you to begin with MI and how do you see MI evolved in the time that you've been working with it? Well, I mean, I never intended to create something called motivational interviewing. This, this came out of uh, some teaching I was doing in Norway uh, with people who were working with um, clients with alcohol problems. And they wanted me to demonstrate the way in which I was, was counseling people with alcohol problems. And so I was doing that. And they would stop me and ask me very good questions. They would interrupt me and say, no. What are you thinking at this point? Um, and in particular, you, you know, you asked that question. Now, you could have asked many different questions. Why did you ask that question? Or of all the things that the client said, you, why did you reflect that particular thing? And they, they literally evoked from me some decision rules that I was uh, using that I had obviously learned from my clients somewhere along the line. But I wasn't conscious of myself. And together we began to, um, to write down those decision rules and, and uh, try to describe a particular way of counseling that, that I wound up calling motivational interviewing. And just wrote it down and sent it around as a discussion paper to several colleagues to say, what do you think about it? Uh, to my astonishment, one colleague wanted to publish it in a journal. Um, and that was the first clinical description of motivational interviewing in 1983. Hmm. And it just took off like a rocket from there. So uh, it, it was not uh, by any forethought or, or sure. you know, logically derived from a theory to begin with. And it's exactly what Carl Rogers was doing, which is looking carefully at practice and listening to tapes of practice and trying to understand what is it. Um, that we're doing and how does that benefit clients. So it's building from the ground up. And the evolution has been astonishing to me. There, there are now almost 800 uh, randomized clinical trials of motivational interviewing in the literature. Wow. Uh, more than 100 meta-analyses. It's just been a, a huge literature. We've learned a lot about why it works. We've learned a lot about how to help people learn it and how to teach it. Um, <laughs> So there's just a huge literature on this approach that grew right out of the work of Carl Rogers. <coughs> Thank you. It's very exciting. I've, the first one I read was probably your first edition. I think you're up to edition three now, which has changed slightly. So um, thank you for that. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So question two, Bill, uh, I've got here. What advice would you give us in regarding to working with resistance, working with clients that are just a bit stuck, you know, the smart recovery clients that we work with? Because it is a group mm -hmm. setting that we work with. Sure. Well, my first bit of advice is to give up the idea of resistance. Uh, resistance, what we call resistance, is an interpersonal phenomenon. It takes two people for it to occur, and, and yet we tend to attribute it to the client uh, and blame it on their pathology or their being difficult or whatever. Mm -hmm. but, but what I know is that it's very responsive to the way in which you talk to people. So I, I can teach you how to have clients who are very resistant. I can teach you how to have clients who show you very little resistance. And it, it's very much a function of the way in which we counsel. So. The reason that uh, we developed the impression that everybody with addiction is in denial and is horribly resistant and has huge defense mechanisms is we had a very confrontational, in-your-face, um, authoritarian, directive style of counseling. Yeah, and that's, sure. that's simply what it evokes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. So we more are, are talking about a way of responding to resistance that does not strengthen it. And fundamentally, it's a Rogerian way of responding, of, of listening to and honoring and understanding what the person is saying, 
um, but not getting stuck there. So it's it's really the therapist who can get stuck more than the, more than the client. Yeah, sure. I think in my own experience, I think it's probably my own uh, things that I've got in the way from someone changing. I bring my own baggage to 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 the counselling setting sometimes. So that's very very true. So, uh, so number three, Bill, um, how have you used MI specifically with people with problematic behaviours? So really with addictive behaviours, and why do you think it is so effective, and why does it work at all? Well, that's a question I asked. I mean, because when I wrote that first article, we had no data at all. Uh, and as we began to collect outcome data, and, and other people did too, the surprise is in a, in a conversation, often a single conversation, um, people who have had a, a, a destructive behavior or a pathological or problematic behavior for 10 years or so turn a corner. Uh, in response to a, a, a conversation, and that wasn't supposed to happen, according to my psychotherapy training. My, my sense was the longer you spend with me, the better you'll get. You know, And to have uh, that kind of response happening to what looks like very minimal or even no formal treatment was a surprise. Mm. Uh, essentially, though, I think what we're doing is activating the person's own self-regulation, their own natural change processes. Um, and in some ways, you just need to do that and then get out of the way. I mean, let the, uh, let the change um, progress. But there's now a very large literature showing, certainly within the field of alcohol and drugs, that even a single conversation of, of the right kind uh, with a person that's got a persistent alcohol and drug problem um, can uh, can trigger a change in that, and mm. we didn't know that in the, in the 1980s. But now we now we know that that is not only is that possible, but we know something about why and how it happens, and and yeah. how to teach people how to do that. Sure, yeah. And something with within smart. I mean, smart in itself stands for self management. You know, and. Uh, you know, we're always saying to, in training in the facilitators that we're the facilitators are there at the word facility just to ease the process so that they can engage that motivation to change and, and as you say sometimes it's about just getting out the way a little bit um, and just yeah. helping them helping them come to their own conclusions and their own uh, elicit their own motivation and their own change talk but using the skills to try and get to that point for them so Great. That's already there within the within the client, I and mean, they already Absolutely. have within them the motivation for change and some wisdom about how to do it. So you, you want that as your co counselor. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, moving on, Bill. Um, number four. So in smart recovery, we we use I guess the the, the philosophy of MI and the and the conversations, the CBT tools. It is a, in a mutual aid group. You know things like you know as you say, developing discrepancy, expressing empathy, um, amplifying ambivalence, rolling with resistance, those kind of things. Cost benefits, confidence scales, ABCs. You, you, you name it. Those kind of things we try and utilise through through the time in the groups. What tools and techniques have you found particularly useful in facilitating group work or is that something you've been involved in before? I have. There, I mean, there are people who have certainly done a lot more with group work uh, with motivational interviewing than I have. Uh, there's a very good book on motivational interviewing groups written by Chris Wagner uh, and Karen Ingersoll, who I think probably know more about this than anybody else I know. Um, and the, the, the challenge principally, well, there are two, I think. I mean, one is managing group process while you're trying to do this at the same time. Uh, and so that's, that's tricky. But the other thing is that motivational interviewing is very much about the person having a chance to voice their own motivations mm -hmm. and to be helped along that path of, of change talk. Yeah. And in groups, normally each individual doesn't have that much air time. Um, and so they've been developing ways to, to, um, to facilitate the process with multiple clients in the room uh, at, at the same time. And there, there are positive trials now of motivational living in groups. But I, I certainly find it more, uh, I certainly find it easier to do this one person at a time yeah, sure. um, than working with a group. 
but you also can use the synergy of, of people together. So as you begin to get change start rolling from some group members, uh, it, it can be contagious. Contagious, so, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, so a few more questions, Bill. Um, number five, a apart from rule and ORs, the, the, some of the principles, what are some simple introductions to MI do you suggest we provide our smart facilitators with? Well, the, the third edition is you know, in a re reflection an awful lot of evolution and growth in motivational interviewing. For, for example, we no longer use principles. Uh, that was a, something that we had in the first and second edition. And we let that go in part because I think you can develop a, a, an incorrect sense of understanding by writing the principles on the board. Sure. Um, and we've gone more to a four process model of motivation interviewing. Yep. Um, yeah, that involves yeah, first engaging and each of these has an everyday word to describe them as well. But the engaging process, which is predominantly the Rogerian uh, reflective listening process, um, focusing, which is getting clear on what your goal is and where you're going. What's, so the, the question that I use for engaging is, can we walk together? And the question for focusing is, where are we going? Now, and the third process, which is the one fairly unique to motivational interviewing, is the evoking process, where your your task is to call forth from the client that which is already there, their own their own motivation, their own ideas about how to do this. Uh, and the underlying question is something like, you know, what why do you want to go there? You know? hmm. And then finally, there's the planning process, which is how we're going to get there. Um, and so often, treatment programs jump straight to planning, skipping over the other three processes, yeah. and then are surprised that the plan doesn't go well. <laughs> yeah. you know? so I, I think that four-process model is, is, a, is a much better way of understanding uh, and teaching motivational interviewing than our old listening of, of these kind of disembodied principles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, if you're familiar with Smart Recovery, we have a, a four points that we focus on. You know, point one is uh, building and developing motivation. Then we move on to coping with urges and cravings, then around the problem solving around some of those strategies, and then a bit of a lifestyle balance. So I'm always saying in training, you know, when we're training the facilitators, we're just we seem to be wired to want to jump ahead and solve problems and, 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 and dump into treatment when we actually haven't found some areas of importance that are really going to motivate them to want to change in the first place and we tend to rush ahead too much and that's where we get resistance I feel. And, and, indeed and the behavior we call resistance is a signal to you to not do more of what you were just doing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, it's like back up, back up. Something's yeah. gone wrong. <laughs> it's your it's your client giving you immediate feedback, which which helps to learn when yeah. you know that. Absolutely. And, and when you hear change talk, it's your client telling you you're doing fine. Go right ahead. You know, so. Yeah. So it's, like it's, like in, it's like that invitation. It's like that invitation to walk with you, isn't it? Like you said. Yeah. One of the things that emerged from motivational learning research that I think is really useful is learning to attend to particular things the client is saying that tell you whether you're on the right path or not. And getting that kind of immediate feedback is the way we learn, is the way we uh, you know, learn how to do better what we're doing, and it's the client who's teaching you. Sure, absolutely. I mean, they're the experts after all, Bill. Um, mm -hmm. So number six, uh, SMART is a group process with multiple participants present and involved. Can you recognize any limitations or constraints around you know the MI philosophy and SMART and are there any challenges in implementing implementation or efficacy? Well there they are what I said you're managing a group process that has some contagion in it that can go in either direction hmm. I mean we, we some of our early uh, motivational being groups were with uh, university fraternity boys yeah um, and they quickly began to tell drinking war stories and that's contagious also, uh, and, you know, doing precisely the opposite of what we had hoped would be happening in the group. Sure. Uh, so you have to manage that. 
um, and and be conscious that what you're trying to do is to elicit this thing that we call change talk now. In the first edition, it was called self-motivational statements. Um, and when you have that, then you begin to think about how you can structure your group so that you're, you're evoking change talk from the participants there. Um, and it's, it's a, a different strategy from just a didactic one where you're trying to teach content. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. So just last couple of questions, Bill, and we'll, we'll let you get on with your, I'll see with your day. I think it's actually evening in New Mexico at the moment. So um, number yeah, seven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the sun's setting. Um, so what advice would you give our smart peer facilitators in relation to developing the REMI skills? Can you suggest any further reading or anything that would help them? Yeah, we know quite a lot about that, actually, and, and <clears throat> developing skillfulness with reflective listening is a, is a first step. Well, maybe a second step. I guess a first step is, is the willingness to consider whether you think your clients actually have some wisdom that you could evoke from them. Uh, if, if you begin with the sense that your clients uh, are ignorant or in denial, then you just have to insert into them what they're lacking, it's going to be very hard to do the next step, you know. Yeah. Um, but if, if you're at least willing to entertain the, the possibility that, that clients have something to contribute in their own recovery, uh, then skillfulness in exactly what Carl Rogers was teaching is, is fundamental. And, and when I'm working with an individual um, uh, person, trying to learn this, that's the first thing we work on, to, to get to the place where reflective listening is just comfortable and becomes sure. sort of automatic. just becomes part because of the way you communicate. Yeah, That's right. Hmm. Because in motivational interviewing, you're, you're strategically using those Rogerian skills. That's what ORS is all about. Um, that, yes, you ask open questions, but you ask particular open questions. Uh, yes, you reflect, but you're more likely to reflect particular things and less likely to reflect other things. Yes, you use summaries, but what do you put into the summary? No, no one told me when I was being trained in a person-centered approach what to put into a summary, or how to choose what to reflect, or, or how to decide what questions to ask. And what we've learned in the motivation is there's some guidance on all of those things. Um, and um, so I, I think that's one of the more useful things mm. that we've uh, contributed that, that there's a lot of guidance coming from the client themselves about when, when you're headed in the right direction. Sure, sure. And not a question I, I'd sent you, but I'm just intrigued, you know, from a peer perspective, you know, someone who has a wealth of experience that they've gone through and journeyed themselves, but then they become the helper as a such. How do you kind of hold back that experience and knowledge when you're running out like a group that actually you're trying to get that change talk from within them, but you have actually some really valuable stuff that you can share with them because you are a peer. It's a very different role that some of the um, some of the facilitators have with Smart. I don't know if it's a different role. I mean, it, by virtue of my professional training, I'm chock full of all kinds of ideas that I can share and suggest. And in motivational interviewing, there is a lot of restraint uh, to, you know, even in, in graduate training, you're taught to, oh, I know the answer, you know. You know? And so at least early in, in learning counseling skills, there's a tendency to want to be the answer provider, uh, to, to be uh, giving solutions and information and answers to people. And that generally doesn't go too well. Sometimes people are open to that if they're pretty far along with the change process, but more likely it's going to um, evoke some defensiveness from mm. folks. And what, what we find is that the similar thing in the addiction field is people who are in recovery uh, becoming counselors, which, which very often happens. At least in the first year of recovery, they seem to have a very difficult time um, not identifying with the clients, um, you know, separating themselves from the client. And if you, if you over-identify, uh, it actually gets in the way of good listening. You're, you're assuming you're talking to yourself, when in fact what you're talking to is a very different person. Mm -hmm. So it could be that early in the recovery process, just that kind of distancing 
um, and um, you know loving detachment is just harder to do because you're still working your own stuff. Sure. It is. But but the listening skills once you learn them you can do that you can put that hat on and just remind yourself that's what you're doing mm. and it, it causes you to let go of the idea that you have the answers for this person and your job is to provide them yep absolutely it's interesting you're wearing that different hat and I found that in my own professional roles where my personal experience can come into it. I, I, I metaphorically put a different hat on before I walk through the door of that room uh, that I'm a different yeah. person and I'm in a different role at this moment in time. So that's interesting. So just final question, Bill. Can you tell us about how learning and practicing MI can not only make a significant difference to the participants but to actually the helpers themselves? Well, that's the thing that interests me the most now. I'm, I'm, I am retired, but if, if I were doing research myself, I would now be wanting to study and understand how it changes you to to learn a person-centered approach, first of all, because that certainly had a huge impact on me and, and motivational anything. And I, and I hear lots of anecdotes from people who come to training or people who have become trainers um, about how this has made such a difference in their in their own life and in their work, but don't, we don't have good science on it yet. Mm. The things that I often hear are it lifted a burden off my shoulders. Uh, I didn't feel like I had to fix all these problems myself. Uh, I had to come up with all the answers, or I had to make people change. Uh, there's just there's an acceptance that people get to make their own decisions. And ironically, when you accept that, it becomes more likely that they will change. You know. So that lifting of a burden, um, enjoying my own work a lot more, is uh, is something that I hear a lot. I, I was I was burning out, um, and I I I learned this approach, and it's just so much more enjoyable to do my work now, and I get to know my clients at a at a deeper personal level, and. That's why I went into this field. Um, I, I think also, right, this, is, this is right out of Rogers, that, that as you practice this kind of accepting, reflective listening, you become a more accepting person. Yeah. You become more open to varieties of experience and different ways of looking at reality. Uh, and as you extend that acceptance to other people, you also experience greater acceptance of your own shortcomings as well as experience and, and so self-acceptance and acceptance of others are sort of reciprocally related and in one study in which we were teaching uh, the, the skills of reflective listening the thing that we found in our research was an up goal was low self-esteem that that people who who were rather unaccepting of themselves had a hard time extending that acceptance to other people as well but I think the the good news is as you practice this, it teaches you acceptance, you know. So that the method itself is a teacher. Yeah, sure. And I it's something about that, about acceptance and kind of peacefulness with your own person and with with differences in society. I've been teaching listening skills in this country where we, we now have horrendous political divides and uh, the Republican and the Democrat are like polarized in a way I've never seen in my lifetime and have stopped talking to each other all the way from family and, and friends to Congress you know if the person's on the other side you just don't talk about it um, but this kind of listening skill you can put that hat on and essentially interview a person who has different very different views to your own and, and with a goal of understanding. No other goal than just than, than understanding what the person's views are and how that's linked to their values. Mm. That's a very positive thing to do. Um, and, and in our country, it's particularly needed right now where we, where we have such tribes or, or camps of, uh, of politics. Yeah, sure. And I, I think in my time, you know, with motivational interviewing, I, I just see it as a way of being, not only in profession, but with your family and friends, you know, and it actually um, helps improve those relationships with your clients and with your family and friends as well, and rather than being a, a principle much. that you're using or a technique that you're doing or anything like that. And yeah, 
Well, that's great. Bill, we, we might have to move on, um, but I just want to thank you so much for your time today. I'm sure it's been invaluable for uh, those attending today to hear um, from yourself. Um, I'm sure the rest of them can say thank you. Just thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so thank much, Bill. Well. It's a pleasure.